Because I love blueberries. I hate it because everybody's busy. Nobody's here except you guys. And I appreciate you being here. It's a lot easier to te teach and to talk to people than it is to my computer screen like I did a year ago. So, I mean, this is good. This isn't bad, but, you know, it, it is nice when harvest is over and everybody's back together. That's really the idea behind uh, waiting on the baptisms now. I mean, there were a number of people disappointed because we had rain last week because they knew the harvest was starting and they wouldn't be able to be there. It just seems like a good idea to get the whole family together, all the church family, and we'll all celebrate the baptisms together. So we'll wait. We'll wait for them. It'll be a good thing. Rather than, all right, Lord, I hear you, you know, rain. We've had a lot of rain this month, though, haven't we? What an unusual July it's been. But praise the Lord. He knows what we need. I did want to mention as well, you know, Jeff mentioned we'll have the quarterly meeting next week. That's assuming we have a quorum, which means we need a certain number of members to be present. And if, you've, uh, if you're not a member, and you have questions about membership, or you're interested in becoming a member, we actually have a little book we can give you to read, and also uh, more than happy to sit down and talk to you about those things, so, or that thing, membership, so just want to mention that as well. Um, but... Obviously, it's not required that you be a member to come and be a part of what the Lord is doing here. It's just good to be with you all this morning. Well, last week, we were in chapter 11 of Revelation. So this week, as we move into chapter 12, we're trying to get a big picture of everything, I suppose, in a sense. Um, really taking a break, though, for a few chapters from the description of God's judgment. And we're going to get a broader view of events and reasons that are behind the reason we have God pouring out His wrath. So, Revelation 12 begins with the words, Now a great sign, uh, this is the first of seven signs that John relates. Uh, verse 3 is the second one, so we're looking too far until we get to them. But um, what we're going to look at are the main figures over the next few chapters, chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the uh, main figures of the Great Tribulation, and really a time itself, because we're going to meet this woman who represents Israel. That's the first sign. Then there's a dragon who represents Satan. There's a male child, speaking of Jesus. We'll uh, also see Michael, the archangel, who's head of at least a third of the angels, maybe all angels. Um, we have the offspring of a woman, of the woman, which is the tribulation saints that we'll meet at the end of this chapter. Then we have the beast that comes out of the sea, which is the Antichrist, and the beast that comes out of the earth, which is the false prophet who promotes the Antichrist. So all these people are, or entities, or whatever you want to refer to them as, we're, we'll be talking about over the next um, few chapters. So, just to give you a little overview before we do another overview, which is what chapter 12 is. But let's pray, and uh, let's get into chapter 12 this morning. Father God, we do thank you for allowing us to gather together here in this place. Lord, always good to gather with your brothers and sisters. Gather, Lord, to hear your word and to consider, Lord, what it is that you want to share with us. So, give us ears to hear. Help us, Lord, to... Set aside all those distractions that want to crowd their way into our mind. Help us, Lord, just to focus on you and what you would say to us this morning. Please bless our time. And Lord, we do pray your blessing as Bill prayed for those who are sick and not able to be here. And also for those who are engaged in the harvest of blueberries. Lord, we pray your protection and your blessing upon them as well. So bless all these things, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. So chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. So, kind of a different looking woman. Kind of uh, unusual, I suppose. But it's really easy for us, if we stick to 
Scripture. You know, the best commentary on Scripture, on the Bible, is the Bible itself. That's where we find most of the information we need, especially going through uh, the book of Revelation. A lot of Revelation refers back to other passages and other portions of Scripture. And that's why it's important to read the whole Bible. A lot of people, especially in the last I don't know, 50 to 100 years, they've kind of, maybe even longer than that, but they've kind of disregarded the Old Testament and kept their focus in the New Testament. But without the Old Testament, we don't really understand, really, the purpose for Jesus coming. It's all explained in the Old Testament. The, the idea that, and especially in Genesis, that sin has entered the world, and death by sin, and how God, because he loved the world, sent Jesus to pay the penalty for sin and death, so that we could be set free. And, and so, so much of what we will read and even hear, this here about a woman clothed with the sun, what's that all about? With the moon under her feet, and with her head, a head of garland and twelve stars. Well, if you go back to Genesis, chapter 37, we have there a dream that Joseph had. And it talks about this very thing. In Genesis 37, verse 9, Joseph, you know, he, he was a dreamer. He had a bunch of dreams. And verse 9 says, And he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. And said, Look, I dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So there we have the sun, the moon, and eleven stars, not twelve, but Joseph is the twelfth, so he just sees his eleven brothers bowing down to him. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brother indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. So you see here this reference to the sun and the moon and the stars here, being the descendants of Jacob. Being Jacob and Joseph's mom, uh, Rachel, and then the 11 stars being his 11 brothers. And we know that ultimately this dream was fulfilled, if you've heard the story of Joseph, how he was sold into slavery, and he ends up in Egypt as a slave, and in a story, a remarkable story, how he goes from being a slave to being second in command of the greatest nation on earth. That's quite a jump. And I heard a guy many years ago talk about what a difference a day makes. Here's Joseph in jail, in prison. And the next day, he's second in command. Go from prison to being vice president. In our reference, in our land, think of that. Taking uh, Kamala Harris's place. Oh, would it be? So wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, that it would happen. Where is Joseph, anyway? But to go from that place of being a, a prisoner and a slave to being second in command. And then, of course, there was the famine, and his brothers came down to buy food there, and he, they actually did bow down before him. And you wonder, did he think of that dream? I think he must have when that happened. But anyway, it's pretty easy to see how this first verse back in Revelation 12 speaks of the nation of Israel. Because the 12 tribes were the descendants, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 sons of Israel. Jacob is called Israel. God changed his name to that. So that's where the nation of Israel came from. So when we read this, there was a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. It's pretty clear to see that we're talking about the nation of Israel. And verse 2 says, And being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And so, giving birth, it is God who chose the nation of Israel to be the nation through which his son would be born. He determined that himself. We see that initially he just made a promise that in Genesis chapter 3 actually that one day a seed of the woman would come and, and salvation would be purchased by that son. 
Then we see it narrowed down to Abraham, and then it would be through David. And, you know, as the line gets narrowed down to who, what tribe his son would come through, but it was clear that it was the descendant of Abraham. That it would be them. And this is the purpose of Israel, to be the nation to bring the Messiah into the world. That was why God chose them. That's why they're called God's chosen people. He chose them of all the nations. Well, I mean, does it really matter who the Messiah, what tribe, what nation, what people he would be born into? It only matters because God gets to choose, and he chose. It could have been any other group of people, but it was not any other group of people. It was Israel. And you see here that, you know, as it talks about Israel being with child, it was as the time came, as we look back in history, and that time came for the Messiah to come, as the world was ready for him to come into the world, it talks about how she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And we see all the trials and troubles. As we look back in history at the nation of Israel, all the difficulty they had during that time. They're under Roman rule, Roman authority at the time of the birth of Christ. Um, and so... You know, we can see how in the past, this verse speaks of the past, when Jesus was to be born. And so that was the scene that he starts with. That's the sign. So, okay, you know, Israel is the one that the Messiah is to come to. And then verse 3, uh, it says, and another sign. Well, before we go there, though, I just think about this. About labor and about pain, I, I almost forgot this point, that... When we think about a child being born, we think about life. And that whole idea that life has come into the world, the idea that, you know, as I mentioned before, sin entered the world and death by sin. We're all under the curse of sin. We all had that sentence of death upon us. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks of that. We needed a Savior. We have to have one. And just talking about has Jesus having come and having purchased life for us, really. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Pretty clear, isn't it? In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We deserve God's judgment. That's who we are. That's who we, we were. But God, verse 4 says, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So I can get that picture, you know, life. We needed life because we are under the curse of death. That's who we all were as a race, as a human race, under the curse of death. And here's this child. This child to bring life is about to be born. And the nation in labor and in pain to give birth. And then you get to verse 3 and another sign here in Revelation 12. Again, another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so we get the scene of God desiring to, he has chosen the nation of Israel. He's desiring that that would be the nation where his son is born. But you see there is an enemy as well, the devil. This serpent, the devil, the dragon. Now what a, a picture, you know, of the nature 
in the character of Satan, this dragon, a scary, awesome beast, and ready just to kill, just to destroy this baby. Now, based on Daniel chapter 7, you may remember when we went through Daniel, um, it's clear that the seven heads, the ten horns, they speak of a revived Roman Empire, something that we will see at some point. I don't know as it will happen before the rapture of the church, but it might. It could. They certainly have a level of influence and it's growing. But the power and the authority of the Antichrist will come through that confederate of nations. And verse 4 says, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. And we understand that to mean that a third of the angels followed Satan when he fell. And those are what make up the demonic spirits in the earth today. We don't see a lot of that, typically, as Americans. Sometimes, maybe, occasionally, but it seems the devil's more uh, deceptive in our land than perhaps other places, other cultures around the world. There are places where there's no doubt where you see that readily. But we don't see that as much in America. And a lot of people discount that. Oh, there's no such thing as demons devils and that kind of thing. A lot of people don't even talk about Satan himself anymore. A lot of churches don't. That's just wrong because obviously God knows there's a devil. Scripture clearly maintains that there is. <clears throat> and Satan, who is he? You know, who was he? Lucifer, another name for him. And, and it may be, it seems like, there were three archangels or three angels that had great authority. Because we only have th names of three angels in all of Scripture. There's Michael, there's Lucifer, and there's Gabriel. And you wonder if perhaps maybe each of them had authority over the third of the host of heaven. And so Lucifer, with those that were under his authority, that when he turned, whatever happened, he was, he was the most beautiful angel, Scripture tells us. And he was... Uh, he was the worship leader in heaven. But pride was found in him, it tells us in Isaiah. That he turned from God. He decided that, oh, look at me, I'm so awesome, that I, one day, will become an authority greater than God. He wants to be God. That's the whole mission of the devil, is to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped as God. And so... As he fell, though, as he did this, he took one-third of the stars of heaven and he threw them to earth. He took them with him. And that's the, the negative influence. That, frankly, though, why? Why would God allow that to happen? Why do we have to have the devil float around? I'm, I'm looking forward to that day when he goes swimming in the lake of fire. I'd be ready for that. But, you know, without the devil... Well, we have no choice. And a relationship where you have choice is so much stronger than one where you have no choice. If God was the only choice we had, we're going to worship Him because we have no other choice, then we would do that automatically. And there's really no room for love within that relationship. It's more of a legal relationship. It would be that type of a relationship. Or a or even robotic, I suppose, programmed this way. But where we have choice, and that's what Satan provides at this time. We can serve ourselves, we can serve anything we want to. We have free will, because we have choice. And when we exercise that free will, to enter into a loving relationship with God, it's a much deeper relationship than just something that's automatic. So Satan serves a purpose right now. I'll be happy when his purpose is over. And when he's gone, when he's done away with it. Um, but anyway, we see here in verse 4 that the dragon hates this child. And of course he does. Because he sees that Jesus is the threat to him having authority. And so he wants to destroy him. He hates God anyway. Um, he hates the child. 
And you see, when you look at the life of Jesus, how even early on he wanted to destroy this baby, born in the manger. We certainly know the Christmas story. You know, the three wise men come into town and, oh, there's another king here. He said, well, let me know where he is so I can go and worship him too. You know, they go, they discover where Jesus is, they go in and worship. But being divinely warned in the dream, they leave and go another way. And they don't tell Herod where the king is, where Jesus is. But you see, Herod is influenced by the devil and wants to destroy the Messiah if there is one. And so the devil stirs him up and says, look, we don't know which kid he is, so just go and kill them all. And that's what happened in that area of Bethlehem. It's in Matthew chapter 2, it talks about that. Um, where he sent his army and they went and killed every male child under the age of two. Herod, he's a weird king. A weird leader. He killed his own kids because he didn't want anyone to rise up and take his authority. And he figured he's going to live forever. Well, guess what? Nobody does. And he didn't. But he didn't. He was uh, insecure, I guess. Felt threatened. And the devil used that to have him kill all these kids. And we see, really, as we look at the life of Jesus, that uh, all through his ministry, especially, the devil was after. And the devil actually, when Jesus went to the cross, thought he'd won. There, we got rid of this. This being, this one, this son of God, this one that would come and pay for sin. No, we got rid of him. And the devil thought he had won. I'd love to have seen his expression on Easter morning. When the stone was rolled away, when Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, the tragedy of it all. In his mind. But the devil hates this child. And verse 5 says, she, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. And so we see here, first the future, I guess. Jesus will come and rule and reign on the earth, and he will rule with the rod of iron. It will be this, you know. The rule of law will be established. You will follow the law, or the consequences will be severe. It will be that way when he rules and reigns in righteousness. But right now, her child has been caught up to God in his throne. That's where Jesus is currently, waiting for that point when he is to return. Verse 6, though, um, we view again the future. Okay, here's all the background. Here's everything as a big picture, what's going on. And now let's talk about the future again. And verse 6 says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Pretty common amount of time. And you see a reference says, a time times and half a time. You see it at um, 42 months. It's three and a half years. All those things, because um, a month had 30 days, always, all the months back then. So when they reference 42 months, it's 42 months of 30 days. 42 times 30 comes out to 1,260, although I didn't do the math. I know it's so. You can do it if you want. Check it out. But somewhere, I think in my notes the last couple of weeks I did that, but anyway. Um, this woman who we've determined to be Israel, there is a point in time where persecution will come again to her. We'll talk more about that, I think, in a minute. But um, God will protect them, though. It, it's so irrational, the hatred toward Israel, isn't it? You think there's a rise of anti Semitism right now? Why do people hate the Jews? What have they done, really? Why is there such animosity toward them? And really, the only conclusion you can come to. I mean, I would think, I can see people hating us Irish. I, I mean, that's, I, that makes sense to me. Or, or other groups of people, but the Jews don't really make that much sense to me. Uh, I don't see the hatred toward them. And the only real explanation you can come up with is this one that they. 
were the nation chosen by God that brought the Savior into the world. So the devil hates Israel. And that's why he also inspired men to hate Israel. It's amazing how it happens. But God will protect Israel, or at least a remnant from Israel, during the three and a half years it's called the Great Tribulation, the second half of the Tribulation period. And many people believe there's a place in the wilderness, um, it's called Petra, city of city called Petra. It's south of the Dead Sea. It's actually in Jordan. And reportedly some Christian, Christian businessmen have supplied an area there with food and gospel tracts. With that in mind. Thinking, you know, at some point Israel's going to have to flee there. And where is that point? I mean, we can, we can figure that out. You go into Matthew chapter 24. The instructions of Jesus, his disciples had come to him in Matthew 24, and they had this question for him. It's in verse uh, 3. It says, Now as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That was the big question. Tell us the future. What's going to happen? We want to know. And so Jesus begins this Olivet Discourse, it's called, where he reveals to them things about the future. And there's so much information in this chapter. But you get down to verse 15 of Matthew 24. It says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. So at that point, when you see that, that is when the Antichrist will enter the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. And that's when the eyes of the Jews will be opened. Because before that time, the first half of the tribulation period, they will look at the Antichrist and think that he is their Messiah. But when he defiles the temple, they'll realize, uh oh, no, he ain't the guy. It's not him. And so he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall it be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect, for Israel's sake, those days will be shortened. So this point, this time when they are to flee, when she, as a Israel personified as a woman, flees into the desert. When will that be? Halfway through that tribulation period. When the Antichrist defiles the temple, it's time to run. You better run. And so all these are now, we as a church, we're in heaven. We're okay. But those here on earth, you know, that's what they need to know. Run. And where? Petra. It really seems. You know, everybody seems pretty certain that's a, a place to go to the place to go to. So the instruction from Jesus on when to flee is at that point. And God has prepared a place. And, and it makes sense. You know, he's used Christian businessmen to prepare it, perhaps. Perhaps that is a place. Perhaps not. I mean, does God need Christian businessmen to prepare a place for them? Not at all. He did pretty good with a couple million people wandering through a desert for 40 years. You know? Their sandals didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They had manna from heaven. They had all the food they needed. I don't think three and a half years is going to be a big deal to it. But it could be that he's chosen to use these guys. And it could be that it's Petra. But I'm not saying that that definitely is the place. But it's interesting that it looks like it could be. And I, I, one of the commentaries I was reading said, as Israel flees, well, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm already in verse 15. We don't want to get that far ahead. So. Anyway, verse 7. <coughs> war broke out in heaven. So after this, war, or at the same time, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. 
And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So we have this epic battle. It's at the midpoint, according to Daniel chapter 12, right in the middle of the tribulation period as well. So when this, the Antichrist defiles the temple, we have this battle going on in heaven. And I don't know if it's a, a material battle or something that can be seen from earth, People can look and see, or if it's just a spiritual battle and nobody's really aware of what's going on, I don't know if there's going to be a whole bunch of noise in the heavens or whatever. We don't have a lot of information about this, really. However, regardless of how it is fought, we know that Michael prevails, and we know that Satan no longer has access to heaven. Isn't that amazing that he still does? As we read about in Job, it talks about how the angels of God came before God, before the throne, and that Satan came with them. And he still is coming with it. Here in verse 10 of Revelation 12, it calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And that's what he's doing there. To accuse us night and day before God. He's continued, continually has had access to do that. But after this battle, it says, no place was found for them in heaven any longer. He's cast out. And verse 9 says that. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He's done. He's gone. He tries to get into heaven. Big sign, access denied. You are not welcome here anymore. So the deceiver, you know, among all the other things, the serpent, a reference back to the Garden of Eden, you know, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call it, he's the one who deceives the whole world, the deceiver. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with it. You're all done. And uh, <clears throat> this here is the second of four falls, fallings of Satan. The first we can read about in Ezekiel 28 where he falls from a glorified state to a profane state, where he has fallen out of the grace of God, where he's become really the devil. The second one is here, where he's denied access into heaven. He no longer has that Influence and ability that he did have. It's another fall. He's fallen from heaven to the earth. When we get to Revelation 20, we'll see how he falls from the earth into the bottomless pit. And also in Revelation 20, from the pit to the lake of fire. And that is going to be a celebration. That will be a party. That's going to be. There's going to be hamburgers and hot dogs. There's got to be. I mean, that's got to be good. You know, maybe a fair street, even. And bounce out a few other things. We have a party. Four different times in Satan Falls. And never to rise. There's no redemption for the devil and his angels. There's no help. There's no future. There's no blessing to come. There's no redemption like we have experienced. Mankind has fallen. But God has paid a way for us to be restored. There is no restoration for the devil. He is doomed. And verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Yes, indeed. So the accuser is gone. God says, get out of my face, devil. I'm done with you. And he kicks him out of heaven. Michael makes sure he leaves. He's gone. And it's, it is a, a time of rejoicing in heaven. A 
time of celebration. But what we see here as well, though, are three things. Three, uh, three keys, I guess, to overcoming the devil. To standing against him. And the first one, verse 11 says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Understanding, re being mindful of the reality that your sins have been paid for by the blood that Jesus shed. Because this accuser of the brethren, he likes to bring up our past. I don't know, I, I assume for you, like he does for me, he wants to remind us of our sin. And I heard a guy a long time ago say, when the devil wants to remind you of your past, remind him of his future. You know? I like where I'm going a whole lot better than where he's going. You know? And because Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, came, he lived the life we could not live. He lived that sinless life. He's the one that paid the penalty for sin. By dying on the cross. And he proved it three days later by rising from the dead. And that is eternal life. Believing that, that's eternal life. We have eternal life. But he wants to he wants to deceive us. He wants to say to you and to me that no, the blood of the Lamb was not sufficient for the sin that you have done or that I have done. And that's a lie. The blood of Jesus is the most powerful agent all the earth. Better than Mr. Clean. Better than it's fantastic. They didn't have that anymore. I don't even know if you see, see how much cleaning I do. Um, better than any cleanser. Because it washes a dirty soul. Washes it clean. What a wonderful thing. So Jesus died. And so that's the first thing. We overcome Satan by reminding him that our sin has been paid for by the blood of the Lamb. The second thing, it says, and by the word of their testimony, knowing and remembering the work of God in your own life, personally, that's your testimony. What has God done for you? What have you seen Him do? How can you declare to anyone who would ask you that there is a God? What's your testimony? How has He worked in your life personally? And so, you know, Satan will try to deceive you, saying, you know, God can't help, or God's not real, or there's all kinds of deceptive things that the devil tries to say. But, you know, well, well, wait a minute. I remember what happened when I accepted him. I remember what happened. And we have all these things, that, and, and now, all these years, having walked with the Lord, and all the times I've seen him do things for me, and for my family, and for those people around me. There's no denying there is a God. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, and the testimony of God revealing himself in nature, but individually as well. Because people want to argue with you about whether there is a God or not. And you can argue back.